Good morning, Sea Life. You can have a seat. Man, this is a great looking crew today. If you're in the building, we want to say welcome to you. We're so glad that you're here. And I want to say welcome to those joining us online. In fact, I want you to help me welcome them. You know, we have people joining us from all around Dallas. We have people from all over the state and all over the country and other countries, people, countries like Guatemala and Ghana and Peru and Thailand and other countries as well. So if you're in the room, can you just help me welcome those people watching online? Yeah, we're, we're so honored that you would join us today, and uh, we are in this series called Secret Sauce, and you probably have heard this, but this is a group series, and so what that means is that really twice a year, uh, we find a series that we go, man, this would really be a, a great topic for people to have some discussion around, and we provide some um, really detailed um, resources for you to meet with some other people and group up with some friends or family members or coworkers. And so even if you're joining online, we, we want to provide resources for you to group up. And so if you're in another country and want to find a few people around you to group up uh, with us in this series, we would love for you to do that. And we want you to know um, that it's not too late for you to group up. There's still time, okay? There's still time, and so if you've, if you've missed the first couple of weeks, uh, you could start with us today, and you could just continue on in the series and, and catch up with us, so, so don't hesitate to do that. If you need help getting in a group, uh, you could see Kyle Roseberry, our campus pastor, or Brad Carroll. Uh, they would be in the lobby after this service. They would love to help you. If you're online, uh, you can contact Rocky Hernandez at sealifec.com or Hernandez, and he would help you get grouped up as well. So thanks for being here today. We're excited about this series. Now, uh, some of you may have heard me tell this story but uh, some years ago, I think it was, well, I know it was 25 years ago, 25 years ago this April, uh, David Griffin, one of our co-pastors, David Griffin, you know, uh, the David Griffin's the bald one, you know, and so if you're looking for, we know you identify us these ways. You're, you got Randy, the, the, the heavier set one, David, the bald one, then the, the good looking one. And so, um, no, we, we know you identify us this way. So um, anyway, so David and I, we got offered a free ski trip. And so we were group leaders. We would take a group skiing and, um, and we both were at different churches. And so this, this travel agency that we used, they offered a free ski trip. Now I like anything that rhymes with free. Okay. And so I was like, Hey, let's do this. So we went on this group leader ski trip. Now, the way that they do these things is they wait to the end of the season when there's really barely, barely any snow. Like, okay, so you might be on snow, you might be on gravel, but, but anyway, it was free. So we go to Colorado, we're skiing, and, and we get to the, I think it was the second day, middle day, and it was April 1st, okay? Now, April 1st, we're skiing along that day, and I don't remember whose idea it was, but one of us said, hey, today's April Fool's Day. We should play an April Fool's Day joke on our wives. Now that feels harmless, right? Like, are y'all are with me on this? Like what could go wrong with this? So um, I should say for full disclosure that my, I remember it was 25 years ago because my wife was pregnant with my oldest son at the time. She was about five months pregnant. Now I don't, I don't know where that ranks in you know, what's happening with the baby at that point, but I know it's pregnant enough to know you're pregnant, okay? And so she was about five months pregnant at the time we go skiing that day. We came up with our, our idea for how this prank was going to work. We had our little script. We go to dinner. We, we honed it in a little bit. And here was the script. It was, I thought it was, I thought it was foolproof. Okay. Here's how it worked. We were going to call the other person's wife. So David was going to call Jill and we've been talking about it all day. And, and we had kind of, um, had this conversation about, do you think your wife will fall for it? And my response was, I don't think Jill will fall for it. Jill was teaching seventh graders at the time. So I'm like, she's had seventh graders all day. I'm sure they've been playing these pranks. She's not gonna fall for this. So we go to dinner, we honed in the script a little bit. And here was the script. The script was, um, David was gonna call Jill and he was gonna say, hey, Jill, this is David. Listen, you don't need to worry. We thought that was a nice, kind touch. Would you agree with that? Like, you don't need to worry. We were telling her in advance not to be afraid. You don't need to worry, he was gonna say, but Paul was in a little accident. Now at that point, she's gonna ask the question that you should always ask if somebody tells you this kind of information, what happened? Like you should say, what happened? And when she say, said what happened, David was gonna say, well, he was skiing, he jumped over a little hill, he lost control, 
and he hit his head on a tree and he probably wouldn't be that bad except for today's April Fool's Day. Can we all agree that they're, this is harmless? Are you with me on this? Like you're with me? No, no, like not everybody's with me, but we thought it was harmless, okay? And so David, we go back to the hotel room. We've had dinner. It's, you know, eight o'clock at night. He thought now would be a good time. And so, you know, this was before cell phone days. You had to, remember when you had the calling card? Like you had to pull out the card and you had to dial 79 digits before you dialed the actual number. So David pulls out his calling card and he dials, you know, spends a minute and a half dialing the numbers to get to, that's how committed we were to this prank, okay? And so he dials all the numbers and, and I'm sitting over here on the other side of the hotel room in a little chair. I'm just listening And so David starts, it was beautiful. He starts with the script. He says, hey, Jill, this is David Griffin. Listen, you don't need to worry. Calmed all of her fears. He said, you don't need to worry. But Paul was in a little accident. And then Jill messed up the whole prank because she did not ask the right question. (laughs) Instead of saying, like any man would say, what happened? She said, how is he? Now, I don't know if you know David Griffin very well, but when things go off script, David gets a little rattled, okay? (laughs) Like, have you ever seen it? Like when they don't put the right slides up and David like gets nervous, like, is that the, like, do we have the slide? You know, he gets a little shaken. So that's what happened here. So I'm sitting over here and I hear David over here and David, you know, he's ready to deliver the punchline to get it over quick, to make sure she's not afraid for too long. And and, but then she says, how is he? And David goes, how is he? How is he? And he starts panicking. And he's like, how is he? And he starts getting nervous. And I'm like, oh no, David's panicking. And before I could do anything, he said, he's touch and go. <laughs> I'm over here in the chair and I'm like, touch and go. No, not touch, abort mission, abort, you know, not touch and go. And David says, he's, he's touch and go. And, and, and Jill said, um, wait, wait, you know, she starts going into, what am I gonna do? She told me later, she was in tears. She was immediately thinking about how she was gonna get to Denver five months pregnant. And, 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 and David, then he, you know, gets panicking. and he's like, he's touch and go. And he goes, but, it, but he, he hit a hill and he'd probably be okay, but today's April Fool's Day. <laughs> and Jill, Jill said, what? And I hear David say it again. He, he, he hit a hill and he, and he hit a tree and he would probably be okay, but today's April, and he emphasizes it this time, today's April Fool's Day. And then Jill said these words. She said, put Paul on the phone. <laughs> and I hear David say, you wanna talk to Paul? And I'm like, no, I'm not in the room. I'm not here, I'm gone, you know, don't, I'm at somewhere. And, and, and I, I, I get up from the chair and I walk over very sheepishly, I might add. I walk over to the phone and I'm like, hello, Jill, you know? And she's like, all I hear is click. (laughs) Take out the calling card, dial the 78 numbers again to get to the number. I'm like, Jill, listen, and click. (laughs) Took me four tries, four tries to finally get, to get her to hang on and say, hey, listen, we were, it was just a joke. I'm so sorry. Like we were just messing around and we didn't, I, I, I told her, I said, I didn't even think you would fall for it because I knew you had been teaching seventh graders all day. And her response, I never will forget her her response. She said, well, they are not that immature. (laughs) I know David is, right? Like, finally I soothed things over with her. I, 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 you know, kind of calmed her down and hung up the phone and then we called David's wife and did the same joke. (laughs) He was like, no, maybe we shouldn't do this. I'm like, oh no, we are doing this. Like. Absolutely not. If I'm getting divorced, you're getting divorced. You know, like <laughs> this is all or nothing, you know? And I wonder, listen, have, have you ever felt like life is touch and go? Like, has it ever felt like in life that, hey, this could either go this way or it could go this way? Like, you, you ever felt like that? Like, hey, it, it, it could be okay or it could go really bad. It could go bad or it could be really great. Sometimes it feels like life is touch and go, doesn't it? And in fact, I would just say this to you, and I wanna make sure that you hear this today, like this should be clear. If you're listening online, make sure this is clear to you today. You are not in control. Now, I know that's a little bit painful, 
Some of you it's really painful for, but can, can I just say it again? Like, look at me, make sure you're paying attention. You are not in control. In fact, why don't you turn to the person next to you, look them in the eye and just tell them in a kind way with a smile, tell them you are not in control. Some of you are like shaking right now. Like there, there are people in this room that look like they're, they're, they could need an ambulance. But it's very true. Listen, and I want to make sure, listen to me, listen, listen, listen. I want to make sure you hear this before we go anywhere else in this series. You are not in control. And, and there are things, you can do all of the right things. You can set up all of the right parameters. You can put all of the right safeguards in place and take all the right steps and look at the spreadsheets and feel like I've got everything buttoned up. We are good. And, and how many of you know it can all be turned upside down with one single phone call? Like you are not in control. And I want to make sure you hear this, this series. You're not in control. But there are some things that you can do. There are some things that you can do. There are some ways that you can live your life. There are some principles you can apply to your life that just seem to draw the favor of God. And so you're not, you're not in control. Make sure you hear that before we go anywhere else today. But there are things that you can apply to your life. And the way that we're talking about this is David, we're really looking at the life of David and there seems to be, there seem to be things in his life that, that are like ingredients to the secret sauce. Like if you can just take these things out of the life of David and, and see them for the example that they are in his life, they seem to bring God's favor on your life. And so that's what we've been talking about over the last several weeks. And we talked about how David had a heart that was committed to God. That seems to bring the favor of God. And today I want us to look at, at, at kind of a, an anti-conventional wisdom. So, so conventional wisdom says something like this. It, you, you may have heard this. I don't have a really pithy statement for this, but something along these, those, these lines that if it's meant to be, it will all fall into place. You ever heard that? Like somebody says, hey, if, if, it, if it's what God wants for your life, if it's meant to be, you don't have to force it. You don't have to, you, you just kind of um, let it happen. If it's meant to be, it will all work out. It will come together perfectly. The, the stars will align. The wind will be at your back if it's meant to be. And this is basically saying, hey, you'll know you're on the right path. You'll know you're on the right path when it's easy, when there are no hiccups, when there's no opposition, when there's no resistance. I mean, I mean that's how it was for King David, right? King David, the subject of the series that we're in. He was anointed as the next king of Israel somewhere around the age of 15. He ascended peacefully to the throne in this beautiful transition of power around the age of 30. He had an awesome marriage. Correction, it was marriages. He had eight wives that we know of. Can you just imagine that, guys? <laughs> eight wives that we know of. I don't even know if I can go on just thinking about that thought. <laughs> His kids were perfect little angels. Once king, he lived the rest of his days being loved and celebrated by all the subjects of his kingdom because he was, he was anointed, right? He was handpicked by God. God had chosen him from all the other people of Israel. He was God's guy. Is that how it went down for David? You probably know this, but not at all. Basically, David's entire life, listen to me, basically David's entire life was lived under opposition. Even though we know he was chosen by God, we know he was anointed by God. Let me just show you. We wanna start where, where, where we left off last week. We were in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and it's the, the David and Goliath story. You, you get David. And, when you hear David, you think of Goliath, right? Like David and Goliath goes together. Like David and Goliath, peanut butter and jelly, cowboys and losing. But, um, 
too soon, too soon for that, I'm sorry. But, but right, like you think of David and you think of Goliath. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we have the story, David and Goliath. David's three older brothers were on the battlefront and David was sent by his dad to deliver the sandwiches, the cheese. He was to set up the charcuterie board. Normally he was at home shepherding the sheep, but his dad would have him run the supplies out to his brothers ever so often. And one of the days that David was there, he hears Goliath come out and challenge the Israelites to a mano y mano battle. Like this is winner take all, just me and you. And some of the soldiers around David start talking about this deal that Saul has offered. And Saul, who was the king at the time, had made this offering. And the way that it went down is he said he would make any Israelite that killed Goliath rich. He would exempt him from taxes, which that would be nice, right? Tax exempt status for the rest of his life. And Saul would give his own daughter as a bride for that man who killed the giant. So, so you, you hear there's a, there's a big offering here. And David's like, hold on, come again? Like, what, what, what did y'all say in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26? And I don't know if it was the financial incentive that, that caught his attention or if that Saul's daughter was, was really beautiful or maybe just nice, you know, like I, I don't really know what it was, but something caught his attention. And the soldiers are like, in, in 17, chapter 17, verse 27, the soldiers are like, you just heard the deal. What we said is, is what it is. This is the deal. And then you, you run into this guy named Eliab. Now, Eliab was David's oldest brother, and he's listening in on the conversation that David is having with these other soldiers. When David said, wait, what, what's Saul gonna do? Tell me again, what's he gonna do? And in chapter 17, verse 28, it says this. Now Eliab, his oldest, or his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Now that, that was a jab, wasn't it? Did you hear that? Do you catch these things when you read the Bible? Like, like Eliab is saying to David, hey, we both know what you are. You're a shepherd and you're, you're not even a big flock shepherd. Like you just have a few sheep, David, that you're taking care of. Translation, hey, David, this, this is where the men are. This is not a job for the little boys that take care of a few little lambs, okay? So, so don't you need to go back to tending your sweet little sheep? It's like eight of them now. Whatever are they doing, David, without their fearless leader, this is man stuff, not boy stuff. Why don't you go home? And he says this. He says, I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. Now, that, that's one of those statements that's just so revealing, isn't it? It just reveals Eliab's anger and his resentment for David. I mean, I mean, he knows for certain David's intentions and motivations. And I just tell you, this, this is just for free, okay? This isn't really part of the sermon. This is just a little relational tip. Never assume for certain that you know somebody else's motivations and intentions. When, when you are certain that you know somebody else's intentions of their heart, it may be time to check your own, okay? Not really part of the sermon, just for free. But Eliab is like, I know you. I know you like the back of my hand. I know you better than you know you. And you came down here because you have evil motives. You just wanted to come and gawk at the blood and gore like a coward. And this is old, David's oldest brother saying this stuff. He's calling him evil. It couldn't have felt great. But I love David's response in 1 Samuel 17, verse 29. In 30, it says, and David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. 
I love it because David was not deferred or deterred, not deferred. David was not deterred by his brother's shade. He just turns and he asks the soldiers again, hey, would you repeat for me one more time what the deal is here? What, what did you say Saul would do, the king would do for anybody that defeated Goliath? And when they told him, something really caught David's attention in that offer and David winds up going for it and he's successful and he kills Goliath. This was a big moment, right? Like we all know the story. Thousands of years later, and he's a national hero now, and you would think he would, it would be all love and support from this day forward, and it was for the most part, but it wasn't from Saul. David, not only was he not deterred by his brother's shade, but now he comes to this same sort of thing from Saul. David winds up um, you know, killing, killing Goliath, and he goes back to his normal life, and look at what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 6 through 11. It says, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the, the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. It says in verse eight, and Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands. And to me, they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And look at what it says in verse nine. And Saul eyed David from that day on. And in verse 10, it says, in the next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul. And he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre. And as he did day by day, or as he did day by day, and Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Now, I gotta tell you that last little statement, you might miss this. That says a lot, right? Because if this was about me, it would say, but Paul evaded him once. Like that was the last time I ever went there, but David evaded him twice. Now check this out, this scene. It was the day after the victory parade for the victory that David single-handedly won. Should feel like a, like a big victory, right? This is like a big moment in the life of David, but he doesn't even get to properly enjoy his moment. I mean, this, this is so dumb. Saul is so insecure and out of his insecurity, he lashes out against David. He views David as a threat and he tries to kill him. And I want you to understand this today. David would be running from Saul for the rest of Saul's life. For the rest of Saul's life, David would be trying to evade Saul. For the next 10 or 15 years, David spends his life trying to avoid being killed by Saul. And so we know now David has at least two people in his life that oppose him, the oldest brother and King Saul. And then we read this in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Now the context is this, um, Israel had lost the Ark of the Covenant and that, was, that was represented the presence of God and we don't have a lot of time to go into that whole story but David and his men captured the Ark of the Covenant back from the enemy and they're bringing it into the town into the city of David, and it says this in verse 16, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul. Now, we haven't mentioned this part yet. Yes, that's right. One of David's eight wives was Michal, the daughter of Saul. And you may remember how Saul promised to give his daughter to the person who defeated Goliath. And the daughter that he had promised to give was his oldest daughter, Merab. So Saul told David he was going to give him Merab, but then he wound up giving Merab away in marriage to another man. And so he offered up his daughter, Michal, in exchange, like in her place. Only it wasn't just like simple. The, the, the price for marrying Michal was that David had to bring Saul a hundred, I can't even hardly say this without laughing. I know it's probably my immaturity, but a hundred Philistine foreskins. That's quite a dowry, right? I mean, I love my wife, Jill. 
We've been married for 30 years, but I think I would have had to have moved on at that point. <laughs> but Michal loved David, and apparently David loved her too, because he didn't just bring 100 foreskins, he got 200 just to show his love for her. Now that is true love, right? <laughs> so yeah, there's lots of super functional stuff going on here. David thought he was gonna be married to Mirab, but he's given me call instead, and the father of the bride just tried to kill him. And it says in verse 16, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And so you can add her to the growing list of people who did not care for David, who had criticism for David. And David, it says in verse 20, returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. So you, you got the picture, right? And because I think it's a beautiful picture of what worship looks like. The scripture describes it that says David, and he wasn't, it wasn't just excitement for the battle. It was excitement about his God who had given them victory in the battle. And the way the scripture describes the worship that took place is that, that David was so enthralled with who God was and what God had done that he was just completely out of it in worship. So much so that his wife was watching and his wife was like, oh man, this is embarrassing. How could you be like that? You're supposed to be the king. You're supposed to be dignified. And she comes out and she publicly sasses him. And I love David's response. Again, it's very similar to his tone in response to his brother's attacks. He says, and David said to me, call, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And you're like, dang, he said that, didn't he? Like that was a shot, wasn't it? And he just dished it right back to her and listen to what he said. And I will celebrate before the Lord and I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, or one verse and says it like this, and I'll become even more undignified than this. It's like, if you don't like that, you know, we'll hold my communion cup. <laughs> I, I know there was no communion cup in the Old Testament, but I'm just having a little fun here. But it's like, you're really not gonna like what you see next. And he says, and I will be abashed in your eyes, or based in your eyes, but by, listen to this part. I love this part. Like David, whoa. It says, but by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. It's like, you despise me, but your female servants, they seem to love me. You're like, okay, David, I don't think that part was necessary. Like, I mean, David, you know, he had a lot of wives, so he probably knows more than me, but I would have left that part out. Like, that does not seem to be like toning down the situation. And so now we've got on his list of enemies, his oldest brother, Eliab. We've got King Saul, who also happens to be his father-in-law. And we've got his wife, Michal. And then 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 19 describe how David's third son, Absalom, attempted to kill David and take his throne. His oldest brother and his wife despised him and his father-in-law and his son tried to kill him. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? Do, do you see what we're getting to? David was anointed by God. So hear that today. We know this. We don't have to guess about this. We saw it happen. David was anointed by God. David was chosen by God. David, God said, this is the one who will be the next king. And yet in every direction he faced, there was opposition and resistance. I mean, if we didn't know better, we would think, well, David must have been out of God's will, right? If we didn't know better, we would think, well, David, that there must not have been God's favor on David, but we know that was true, and yet in every direction, even from his inner circle, David faced resistance and opposition. 
It reminds me of what Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. He said, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. See, David's, David's story defies the conventional wisdom that if it's meant to be, it will be easy. It will all come together. There will be no struggle. David was chosen and anointed by God. He was blessed and favored, and he faced challenges and opposition and resistance and difficulties throughout his whole life. There was never a time that he didn't face these. You know, Jesus said it this way. He said, if the world hates you, you should know that it hated me first. That was what, that's what Jesus described to us. So, so if you're able to pull off a life that looks even 2% like the life of Jesus, there are going to be a lot of people who will not approve. Sometimes even so-called Christians won't approve. You will always have people opposing you. So if we're going to keep going and live our lives for God, we're going to live a life that makes an impact for him. We're going to live a life that has, carries an impact into the next life. We're going to have to have some resilience. In fact, resilience is the ingredient that we're talking about today in secret sauce. Resilience, as it's defined by Google, is the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. It's, it's toughness. And I think this is a vanishing trait in the world today, isn't it? Anybody with me on that? That, that we seem to have less resistance or less resilience. We have more resistance, but less resilience than we did before. And perhaps I'm just being a little pessimistic or maybe it's because I'm a grandfather now and so like I'm a wise old, you know, generation ahead of everybody. But doesn't it feel like we're missing some resilience in our world? Like remember when we were growing up and, and we had this little nursery, nursery rhyme. Remember the nursery rhyme? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... It's like, hey, you can survive this. It's a vanishing trait. Other people's opinions today seem to have the power to derail us emotionally and mentally. And I wish it wasn't true of us Christians. Like, I wish that, that this wasn't the same for us, but, but it seems to be the same for us, too. And what I want you to understand today is that people weren't just being mean to David or calling him names. They were trying to kill him. It couldn't have been fun to have so many people in his inner circle say terrible things about him and turn against him. And I'm sure at times he had to be discouraged by it. But you know what he did? Took the advice of that great theologian, Taylor Swift. What'd she tell us to do? You, you shake it off, right? And that's what David did. When, when Eliab accused David of having evil motives, David said, what are you mad about now, Eliab? And he turned around and said, hey, y'all tell me again what the king's gonna do. When Saul tried to pin David to the wall with his spear, David ducked and dodged. And you know what he did then? He showed up for work the next day. When Michal said, how, my, how the king honored himself today, dancing around half naked in front of all these people, David said, well, oh, you haven't seen nothing yet. He didn't pout, he didn't crumble, he didn't retreat, he didn't compromise his own convictions and beliefs. He didn't even really seem to get angry. He just responded with resilience. He kept showing up, he kept moving forward, he kept doing his best to live out his faith in God. And unfortunately, and I, I wanna just make sure you hear this today, unfortunately, I don't, think, I don't think resilience is just something you make up your mind to do. I think resilience is a byproduct for believers. Resilience is, is not something that you just, you know, you just white knuckle and say, I'm just gonna be determined to be more resilient. 
Resilience is a byproduct of core belief. And I, I think the core belief that leads to resilience is this, the only opinion that matters to me is God's opinion of me. See, when you just develop that in your heart, that the only opinion that matters to me is God's, you'll find your life becoming more resilient. Life, life gets, listen, life, life gets a lot simpler when you live for the approval of one. I love what the proverb writer said. He said it this way, Proverbs 29, 25, he said, the fear of man is a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Hey, you know what he said? He said, look, if you're trying to live for the approval of everybody else, it's a trap. But if you'll base your life just on pleasing God, then your life will be safe. When Pastor Craig Rochelle said it this way, he said, becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. And becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what other people think about you. Living under the fear of men will dwarf the impact you could have for God. Listen to what it tells us in John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. It says, nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in Jesus. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved, listen to this, this is a painful statement, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Do you hear that? It says that there were authorities, there were people in Jesus' day that they believed him, but they were so afraid of the Pharisees that they wouldn't express it. Why? Because they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Let that never be true of us. The apostle Paul said it this way, in Galatians chapter one, verse 10, he said, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. See, when, when, you're, when your attention is just, can I please God? You know what you learn? You don't have to fight all the opposition. When, when you're really trying to please God, you can say, hey, when, when the opposition rises, I'll let God fight for me. And the scripture promises he will. In fact, the, the scripture says that vengeance is mine says the Lord. In other words, when you're done wrong, when you're attacked, when you're oppressed, you don't have to launch back. All you have to do is say, God, I'm just here to please you. Isn't that what Jesus taught us? I mean, isn't that the example that Jesus showed us the night before he went to the cross when Jesus is with his disciples and he goes to pray and he's praying and he knew what was gonna happen. He knew how excruciating the painful, the cross and the crucifixion was gonna be. And he's praying to God and you know what he said, God? Not my will, but yours be done. You know what that statement was? That statement was, God, I'm only interested in your approval. I know there'll be a lot of people there at the cross. They'll be chanting a lot of different things at the foot of that cross, but God, I just want you to be pleased with my life. And the apostle Paul didn't just talk about it, he modeled it. When he says it in Galatians, am I, am I trying to please God or people? He, he modeled that throughout his life. In fact, I would say that was what made him so impactful. That was a key ingredient to his secret sauce. I mean, you think about the apostle Paul, like you, you, there was a real conundrum with the apostle Paul, right? Like how were you supposed to deal with the apostle Paul? 
They were trying to stamp him out. They were trying to stop him. But what did you do to stop him? You're like, Paul, if you, if you don't stop telling people about Jesus, then we're gonna beat you. He's like, well, that's been done. Okay, then we're gonna throw you in prison. Do that, I'll just win all the prison guards to Jesus. Paul, okay, listen, you, you forced our hand on this, Apostle Paul. If you keep talking about Jesus, we will kill you. And he's like, oh, I'll get to go be with Jesus. Oh, that'd be great. You see, do you see his secret sauce? Like, I only care about pleasing God. And if I please God, I'll leave the results to him. And I'm just telling you the same thing is true in your life. When you recognize, when you recognize, hey, you know what? I can trust God to be in control of my life. And I don't have to worry about making everybody else happy if I could just focus my heart's attention on an audience of one, pleasing him and making him happy. For some of you today, you've never had an opportunity to do that. There's never been a time in your life when you established this relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I want you to know today, look at me, I want you to know that you don't have to leave here today uncertain of where you'll spend eternity. Jesus, Jesus is better than you think he is. And he'll change your life if you'll let him. So I wanna just say a prayer for you today and we'll be dismissed. Our prayer partners, if you guys would come on down front. Father, I thank you so much for this day. And may, maybe somebody's here today, God, that has never entered into a relationship with you. And I pray that right now in this moment, you would press in on their hearts. They would know right now, right now it would be so clear in their brains that I'm talking to them. And that today they would enter into a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. I pray that as soon as the service is over, they would come down and talk to one of our prayer partners. They would turn to somebody near them that they know has a relationship with you and they would just say, I, I need to have a relationship with Jesus. I pray that you give them the courage and conviction to do that. And I pray for all the rest of us today, God. that you would give us the grace and the conviction and the courage to align our lives with this value of I just wanna please you, God. I just wanna please you. And I pray that today in Jesus' name.